Guten Morgen, meine Freunde, and welcome to the recesses of the past where we see the future with the same degree of awe and mystery as we see in that future now what we view as the past. This week, our lens settles on the week ending 7th of July, 1963, and all the goodness there within. At number 10 this week, we find Kaiyu Sakamoto Sukiyaka, a song I am confident I can say is the only Japanese language hit we'll come across in the course of our adventures. So, any hopeful J-pop fans out there, cushion yourself for disappointment. A record that sold a staggering 13 million copies worldwide. The song is actually about the writer's disappointment after the 1960 Anpo processes, a series of civil disturbances in Japan against a new defence pact with the United States, whereupon the singer hits on the idea of walking with his head back, whistling, so he can't be caught crying. How very inscrutable. At number 9 is the rocking sounds of the Beach Boys with Surfin' USA, propelled into hyperdrive by Frank DeVito's thrilling drumming. This was as good as it got for the boys, stalling for a single week in the top 10, whereas it was Billboard's number one single for 1963 in the USA. Billboard actually draws up its end of the year chart in November, so Jimmy Gilmer's Sugar Shack, which came out during the tabulation period, actually ended up being the biggest seller for the year. Surfing USA has never actually even been awarded a gold record, so it looks like 1963 was a bit of a fizzer for the rack jobbers. Act, Ocho, Huit, Osem. Call it what you will, it only means one thing this week, Mecca by the mighty Gene Pitney. Pitney was always somewhat more popular here in Australia than in the rest of the world. The same could be said for Neil Sedaka and Roy Orbison, where not only his hits hit a little harder, but apart from a few years in the early 70s where he kept a lower profile, he never really left the charts. A guy like Bobby Darren, who had his finger in every musical pie from performance to production, he was a sort of the prince of his day, except not. Mecca is bold, brassy, interesting, hinged on a creaky metaphor, but projects with absolute conviction by Pitney. He had better hits, but this one is far from the worst. Seven is one of four current or former number ones in the top ten this week, The Mysterious Pipeline by the Shantays. School kid friends from Santa Ana, California, who jumped on the surf music bandwagon. Pipeline is an extraordinary record in as much as it feels like it's mixed upside down. All bass and drums on the top, a big reverby lead guitar and a mysterious sounding electric piano swimming about in the murk underneath. It's tense, very cold war and full of dangerous undercurrents. Number six is Jezebel by one of the most important men in the history of Australian music, Roby Porter, billed here as Rob E.G. Now, it's a hokey cover of Frankie Lane's hit of a few years before, but that's neither here nor there. It's what he did in the 1970s that counts. After an unsuccessful stint in England, he came back to Australia and bought a share of, and eventual ownership in, Sparmac Records, for whom he produced Daddy Cool's record-breaking run of hits, as well as discovering Rick, Jesse's Girl, Springfield. A few years on, he founded Wizard Records and had significant hits with Hush, Australia's glamiest glam rock glam fest, Marsha Hines, Rick Springfield and others and helped define the Australian top 40 sound of the 1970s. Before we venture forth into the terra incognita of the top five, let's bask in the finery with a felicitous frolic through the fun-filled fields of factoids within Fowl's fantastic world of facts. The biggest climber this week was indeed Sukiyaka, of eight places to number ten. Our biggest faller of the week is the legend himself, Mr. Cliff Richard, with his big hit Summer Holiday, which tumbled ten places from ten to twenty-two. Amazingly, this song is one of Cliff's most instantly recognisable and enduringly popular tunes, but it only ever made as high as number five. Other great records on the top 40 this week, but outside the top 10, include The Swinging Foot Tapper by The Marvelous Shadows, Take These Chains From My Heart by Ray Charles, Do Ron Ron by The Crystals, Move Baby Move by legendary local rocker Johnny O'Keefe, 18 Yellow Roses by Mr. Talented Bobby Darren, Puff the Magic Dragon by Peter, Paul and Mary, Another Saturday Night by the great, 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 great Sam Cooke, and Ring of Fire by Johnny Cash, which first peaked into the top 40 this week, bound as it was to make number 6. Meanwhile, some young up-and-comers were wobbling their way up the charts with their first hit in the old hometown, The Beatles, with from me to you, which was to reach the giddy heights of number 10. 
Number one stateside was easier said than done by the Essex, and in the old country you'd get short odds about England swinging like a pendulum do to a Beatles popper, and you'd have the right town but the wrong band, as Jerry and the Pacemakers held sway with I Like It. Back into the fray, and fray indeed it does with Bill Justice, the man who went on to write the score for Smokey and the Bandit, and the frankly nuts instrumental Tamure. A slice of Martin Denny on Prozac, this is so kooky, jolly, so utterly out of place with the experience of the rock music listener that it's impossible not to feel good when it plays. That's part of the charm of these pre-rock era top 40s, the oddball, the never will be heard again. The famous Capitol Records building in Los Angeles, that imposing proto googie pile at 1750 Vine Street, is known in the game as the house that Nat built. Not Frank, not Dean, not Peggy Lee, but Nat, as in Nat King Cole. By the mid-1950s, Nat had matured into a superb pop vocalist, especially when he paired with Gordon Jenkins. By the end of his life, he was to die 18 months later. He'd mellowed to the point where he was pretty much a generic middle-of-the-road singer, albeit an incredibly popular one. At number four this week, we have those lazy, hazy, crazy days of summer. Some innocuous fluff, which, given the breadth, impact and importance of his career, I firmly believe that Cole's model of small jump combo jive from the late 1930s to the early to mid 40s was a cornerstone of rock and roll music, seems sadly unworthy. But his was a glorious career and the soaring heights easily compensate for sins, no worse than simply giving the people what they want. Number three is the soulful Little Peggy March with I Will Follow Him. Usually thought of as a one-hit wonder, she in fact had three top 40 hits in the US, several in the UK and was a staple in Europe. She's very popular in Germany so far as having two goes at representing them in Eurovision. March is, however, unfortunately best known for having all her earnings protected under the Coogan Law, a US law that ostensibly protects earnings minors who make her when they work as entertainers, only to find that upon graduating from high school and seeking money to go to college, her conservator had stolen all of her money and left her with less than a thousand dollars. Poor Peggy. The John Landy of this week's chart is the song How Do You Do It, here performed by Jerry and the Pacemakers. It is supposed that this was originally planned to be the Beatles' first single, and indeed George Martin came very close to releasing a version of it recorded with the band with Ringo on drums. But his gut took him back to the more swinging, rough-hewn Love Me Do. The song's author, Mitch Murray, went on to a long and salubrious career as a songwriter, sullied only by having written hits for the abominable, egregious, execrable and god-awful Paper Lace, Billy Don't Be a Hero and The Night Chicago Died. Well, it's been a great week and we're all throbbing with anticipation to see the number one. Gene is off sicker this week, so we have a stand-in to drum for us. Music, if you please, Mr. Moon. It's my party and I'll cry if I want to by Leslie Gore. Kitschy, utterly bound to its time and one of the greatest iterations of princess syndrome ever put to wax. This is one of the pre-eminent artifacts of pre-Beatles post-Elvis canon. Like The Lion Sleeps Tonight, it's just a song everybody knows, from rusting, crusted, recalcitrant reactionaries like me to fist-waving city burners, tycoons posing incognito in Portuguese nightclubs, French dukes with legs made of pudding, jazz master playing hipsters in George Mallaby suits, bingo callers, ex-prime ministers and self-obsessed millennials, bored with ironic quiz shows and Billie Eilish. Some records advance the technical and artistic scope of the canon, and some records act as the anchors that tether us in our experiences to it. It's My Party is just one such record. It spent four weeks at number one before being bumped off by Sukiyaka, and then exited the top 40 with almost obscene haste, gone a mere three weeks later. There followed about two months with a different number one each week, until Hello Mother, Hello Father by Alan Sherman spent two weeks atop, and then there were six more number ones in the next two months, as only Roy Orbison and Kathy Kirby offered any resistance. But as a backdrop to this, a strange story was unfolding. The greatest record never to make number one in Australia, and I'm sure that everyone will agree with that seemingly impossibly broad statement, She Loves You by The Beatles, 
had risen in the top 10 to number 6 and was waning back down the charts, actually leaving the charts by the end of November. Then, by the first week of December, I Want to Hold Your Hand comes crashing onto the charts, and by the first week of February 1964, there are four Beatle records in the top 20, including She Loves You, which came back from outside the top 100 to land at number 4. Another wonderful week in that limbo zone when rock was supposed to be dead. But the past contains mysteries, contradictions, and its own particular myths and legends. However, intrepid travellers seek to penetrate the darkness of its interior. And thus, it is my sincere hope that once again, in our next edition, we will be gathered together in bold and cheerful fellowship to explore that dark and baffling foreign country we call the past. <laughs>